Hi guys, and welcome to the um, last part of the science grant for this semester. Today we have Dr. Carlos Gawler, a teaching professor in the biotechnology program at NC State. He is also the advisor of STEM Journal Club and Biotechnology Club at NC State. This was his first semester teaching BIT 295, Biotechnology and Sustainability, which led us to creating science sprints as a way to get our community involved in thinking about sustainability. He will be giving us a tour of the biotechnology program lab in Jordan Hall. Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us uh, on uh, Friday. So how many of you have been in the labs in the biotechnology program? And, and just do a, a show of hands or you can do you a reaction. We've got one person. Anyone else? What do you think we do in the biotechnology program? And how is that related to electronic waste? And you can put it in the chat or unmute. What do you think we do in the biotechnology program in the labs? And how is it related to electronic waste? Or sustainability in general? We have grow microbes in the chat. What else? Oh, directed evolution, that sounds familiar, yes. So that's growing microbes and organisms, maybe yeast, and um, since they grow quickly, we can evolve them over many generations by, uh, by adding selective pressure, for example. What do you think biotechnology is? While you're responding, I'm going to get ready. What is biotechnology? And what do we do in Jordan Hall? So let's do a quick tour. So can everyone hear me? We have tie dye lab coats, eye protection, and I'm going to give you the tour. And we will start with Dr. Goller. Someone in the chat said biotechnology is the intersection between biology and the ways to study it, like lab equipment. Yes, that's awesome. Okay, let me pause this for a second. Okay, can you see or is it blurry? It's blurry. Oh, okay. How about this? Still blurry, right? No, we can see you now. But the background is. Yeah. Okay, let me just. Let's do that. 
Okay, so welcome to the biotechnology program. We're on the sixth floor of Jordan Hall. So we face main campus over there. Wolf Village, and then that's Western. We have a nice view. And on the whole floor are teaching labs and teaching facilities. And we will start with the first lab here, and I'll open it. That's fine. So this is our lab, one of our labs. So that is Centennial over there. And you can sometimes see, uh, see uh, Hunt Library and other things. But the important part here is what we have in the teaching labs. So we are able to teach as well as use the screens to present information and students work in pairs often, undergraduate and graduate students. We use pipe feathers a lot to move little liquids which often have DNA that we've isolated from different organisms to detect different variations in DNA or we can do something like purify by using a floor centrifuge. We now have carts with laptops because we've gone paperless. So all our notes are taken using an electronic lab notebook called Lab Archives, a system, so that we have access to the notes in the lab as well as outside of the lab, and it does version control. So these labs, these laptops stay in the lab. And then you can work and document all your findings and things from a variety of biotechnology courses. So we have from first and second year experiences like BIT 100, uh, which is a survey course. Uh, you learn a lot of biotechnology uh, and you do a series of different experiments and different techniques. We have BIT 295, the new course that we're teaching, Biotechnology and Sustainability, where we are learning about some of these, some microbes that have been isolated from soil. And the soil is rich in rare earth metals. And those are metals that are important for, uh, or rare earth elements that are important important for the production of, uh, of micro devices and, um, and circuit boards that nowadays power lots of things we do. So th this over here is an electroporator so we can shock cells to move pieces of DNA into the cells by using electric shocks. We have lots of heating and water cooling devices you see in different labs, but we also have some different things. We have plate readers where we can grow lots of bacteria or different organisms in 96 well plates. We can inject liquids to test different conditions in the machine. We have a handheld sequencer, the minion, the nanopore minion that's connected to a computer using a USB drive. 
and we can sequence DNA in house. And we have microfluidic systems to analyze DNA. And you may have learned about gel electrophoresis. Well, that instrument gives us, uh, uh, uses microfluidics to do uh, run tiny gels and really quantify how much we have, how much DNA we have and what size. And we're also piloting a new piece of equipment that the company launched last week, last month. It's the Miro canvas. And what you see over there is an array of electrodes. And what this instrument can do, it uses cartridges that are plastic cartridges that have a really sensitive bottom that sits on the electrodes and plastic channels. And using electric current, this instrument moves tiny, tiny volumes of liquid, like one or two microliters using current and it, it moves the drops. And then it's able to heat and cool it's able to use magnetic beads to capture DNA. And it goes from DNA to preparing the DNA for sequencing. And all that to say that we can go from getting a swab or getting a soil sample or taking one of these bacterial organisms that was isolated from soil that may be able to uh, and one of these organisms may be able to help us capture some of those precious elements in electronic waste and reuse them. We can grow the organism. We can go to another one of our labs and as part of another course, the Biotechnology and Sustainability course, the BIT-295 course uses our BitBot, a robot that can help us purify DNA. And BitBot got a friend this semester, which is QB. And QB is a cube with a centrifuge and it's able to mix liquids and isolate DNA from a variety of samples. So again, this is another teaching lab with laptops, freezers, gel electrophoresis equipment, but also some different instruments like another robot, a pipetting robot. And students in this and other biotechnology classes learn how to use these instruments to, for example, the high throughput discovery class learns how to program the liquid handler to do assays in high throughput for lots and lots of samples. Or we can use QB to isolate DNA or isolate RNA. And this is just one of many classes we offer. Our classroom is built for teamwork. So our classroom is has floor that looks like a gel, has some pictures of DNA on the wall, but you'll see that all these tables are movable so that you can work in groups. So if you take bit 100 or bit 295, that's a semester long biotechnology and sustainability class, you can then take bit 410, a molecular biology class, 
that's semester long. And after that, there's a, a, an array of 10 to 12 different, depending on the semester, eight week lab modules. And those modules are topic specific. So for example, if you're interested in using biotechnology to learn about cancer research or growing cells, you may want to take the cancer drug discovery class with Dr. Saruji and learn how to use these microscopes and tissue culture, working in these hoods to take care of animal cells or human cancer cells. We also have a cell culture class that's taught over in BTEC, what is a biotechnology class. And we have now several courses that are related to plants. So for example, I'm not sure what I'm gonna find, but we have classes that are like Jacob Dooms is teaching a class on plant genetic engineering. And in that class, we learn about maintaining plants, growing them in little plates to make transgenic plants. And these smaller hoods are for work with bacteria. And this one's for work with DNA and RNA to keep it really clean. So there's plant work. There's protein work. So if we want to purify proteins, Dr. Bob Kelly, our program director, teaches a class on protein purification. And we also have a class that is works with some of the microscopes. So we have a confocal microscopy class. Now we have an illuminating cancer chemical biology class. We have a class that's on detection of DNA uh, uh, with real-time PCR. And now we're introducing more classes with digital PCR. There are new instruments where we can measure uh, oxygen use by cells and glycolysis and ATP rates with sea biscuit over here and Pegasus over here. They did not get googly eyes, but they are okay. And as far as microscopy, Simba over here, the lion heart is a, an automated microscope. So think about this as a way we can use technology and courses to get involved in undergraduate research and learn a variety of molecular biology techniques. So hopefully that was a quick tour, but useful, giving you an idea of what goes on in the biotechnology program and how we basically serve the entire campus by offering classes that teach molecular biology to first, second year students, junior, seniors, and, and uh, graduate students and postdoctoral scholars on a variety of topics. And this is the prep lab where we prepare things for the hands-on lab experiences. So I'm gonna go back to the office and ask, what questions do you have?
what questions do you have and how can I help? Before we hand it over to Dr. De Los Reyes. And if you come up with other questions later, just let us know. It's really a fun place because we have a variety of topics and courses. And uh, I'm gonna put in the chat some slides that have actually a video uh, tour and also shameless promotion, but we have a whole bunch of exciting courses. Ooh. So we have a question in the chat. What's the difference between biology and biotechnology? And it's, so biotechnology, we, we have a definition on our website that it's the use of um, organisms. Uh, it's a quote from our uh, program director, Bob Kelly. Molecular biotechnology comprises a set of universal lab skills that complement academic preparation in disciplines impacted by the life sciences. So biotechnology is kind of a, um, a set of tools and techniques. That's why we don't have a major in biotechnology. And the goal is to use these techniques to uh, investigate the natural world and create resources that will improve human health, equity, diagnosis of diseases, and industrial processes, and several different things. And I am going to run away because I have to start another call. But is that okay, Rabea? But if you have any questions, let me know, okay? So um, next we have, next up, we have a presentation by Dr. Francis de Los Reyes, who is a distinguished pre professor in the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering at NC State. Thank you for coming, Dr. De Los Reyes. Thanks, Carlos. Bye. And I can also uh, share uh, some insights and answer questions on biotechnology. I'm also part of the biotech faculty. Uh, and you can see an application of that uh, later on. So um, thank you all uh, for coming. And you can hear me, right, Rebea? Okay. Yes. Great, okay, let me, let me share my screen. And I, I do want this to be a, um, uh, an interactive discussion. We have time later, is that correct? I, I think I have 20 minutes maybe to present. Uh, yeah. slides and then talk a little bit about um, global sanitation and then hopefully we'll have a nice discussion and and go ahead and put questions in the chat as they come along right so we're going to talk about sanitation we're going to talk about this this guy here uh, I, I, I'm sure that this is what you wanted to talk about on a Friday afternoon but this is obviously you know all you know what this is and and you use this every single day um, but I want to go deeper into this, right? Into toilets and sanitation. And, and yes, you will use words like fecal sludge and, and poop today. Um, and really that's just part of what we call the sanitation service chain. So the chain starts on the left, you've got a toilet or user interface. And the toilet can be similar to what you're used to, like that picture before, or it can be a, uh, a pan that's flush to the ground. People sit, people squat. You know, uh, depending on the culture, there is uh, containment storage. That's the next thing there. And then conveyance, uh, you have to transport the contents, the fecal sludge, to a treatment facility where you can uh, treat it and then maybe dispose of it somehow. Now, those steps in the middle, the containment, the conveyance, the, the, the treatment, are things that you don't see. Um, because they're just basically sewer lines, pipes under you know, your house, under the ground. So you don't see that. But in many countries, you know, that actually is quite visible. So this is typically, you know, as an environment engineer, this is what I do. I teach design of large wastewater treatment systems. This is an aerial view of a large wastewater treatment plant. And again, you know, if you're in Raleigh, there's a plant in 
you know, uh, false, uh, uh, false of the news um, uh, area, uh, depending on where you live, if you live in Cary or Apex, they've got their own wastewater treatment facilities. Um, and again, these are these giant pipes, giant sewer lines that um, convey the, the sewage and you don't see them. Uh, and they're, you know, closer to the plant, they're big enough, like, like this main, that you can actually fit uh, a whole person in there, okay? So this is all underground. But like I said, in many countries, this actually is quite visible. So here's a collage of pictures. Uh, on the right is a pit latrine. This one is elevated. Um, uh, this is a picture taken in, uh, I, I think, Zambia. I think I took this picture in Zambia, but you can see there's a vault underneath, underneath, and there's a, there's a pan in there, and you can, you know, it says squatting culture. Um, and then basically, you know, when the vault's filled in the back, there's an opening, and people empty that out. And the way they empty some of these, the picture on the left is from Burkina Faso. I did not take that picture, but it's quite a well-known picture. This is called manual emptying, right? So people still do this. There's really no mechanized way of emptying. So they use a bucket and, and people go down there and, and empty it out so they can use it again. And then the picture in the middle is, is actually from Kenya where the sludge is basically transported into these, in these barrels and they're thrown you know, near a body of water like you can see here. And pretty much it's just not treated, right? It's just disposed of in the environment. Uh, here's a picture of what's called a hanging latrine. Again, I did not take this picture, um, but a hanging latrine is basically you do your business, the waste goes down, you know, to the, to the water underneath. And you can imagine this is all very unsanitary, right? Uh, the way that we think about the impact of this is through what's called a, an SFD. Uh, it's called a shit flow diagram uh, because it's a flow mass balance in engineering terms of all of the uh, fecal material in a city or in any boundary. So this is for Dhaka, which is the, the capital of Bangladesh. Um, on the left is all of the fecal sludge being generated. And then you can follow the arrows and see where the fecal waste basically goes. Uh, so there's a little bit of open defecation, that's 1% there. Um, there's a little bit that actually goes to a sewer line. Um, and, and that is, you know, some of it is effectively treated, but most of it is not. And so at the end of the day, if you follow all of the lines, only 2% really uh, is treated uh, to the extent, sorry, can you still see my screen? Okay, yeah. I thought something happened here. Um, yeah, but only 2% on the right is effectively treated, right? 98% of the fecal material is actually not treated um, well before it eventually goes to the environment, whether it's the you know, soil or drainage systems or receiving bodies of water. So it's amazing, right? That this, this data is actually uh, from a few years ago, but it hasn't really changed by much. So if you look globally, these are the numbers. You know, there's about, you know, seven plus billion people in the world, but 3.6 billion people have no toilets at home that safely manage their wastes. That's a lot of people, right? Almost 2 billion people still don't have basic sanitation services. In other words, they don't even have a toilet at home that can be called basic. Uh, almost half a billion people still defecate in the open. And that, that's exactly what it means, right? They hide behind bushes. They do it in riverbanks and so on. So there's still a lot that uh, of people that don't have access to basic sanitation. And of course, when that happens, you've got impacts, health impacts, as well as indirect impacts, sequelae. So obviously, the direct impacts are infections. Here, you can see on the, um, you know, on the uh, left here, you have fecal oral infections. Diarrhea is the number one. Worms or helminth infections, right? Ascaris is a, is a worm that infects and, and basically lives inside uh, intestines, right? Hookworms and so on, and even insect vectors. And that leads to things like stunting or growth faltering, you know? It, it, and, and obviously the, the left column here is really number of infections that lead to deaths, 
right? The middle one is conditions that happen because of that. And that includes things like, you know, lower uh, birth weights, uh, kids don't, not growing up, um, you know, as tall as, as normal kids. And that leads to things like impaired cognitive function. And then there's impact on the bother well-being. For example, anxiety and shame. You know, you can imagine if you don't have access to a toilet, right? You're, you're embarrassed. And beyond that, there can be also health effects, right? You can just hold your, your pee in, right? Um, in a lot of countries, uh, women, for example, have to wait until it's dark uh, so that they can go out uh, to a public toilet or even out into the field. And, and there are obviously things that can happen uh, when you have situations like that. Um, you know, girls, for example, uh, feel like that, that the, uh, there are no facilities in schools, they don't go to school. And so on average, about 60 days per year, girls miss out on school. And, and that's got a big long-term impact on essentially how you can bring, you know, um, girls uh, growing up as part of the economy of a country. So these are all actually um, documented and, and, and economists have done studies of this and they have shown that for every dollar that you invest in sanitation, you get four to five dollars back in terms of the benefits, looking at all the public health and, and economic benefits, right? So this is just another table that quantifies some of the disease burden, the number of deaths in a year that happens, that's on the left-hand side, uh, due to the different diseases. And then this middle column here is called DALIs, uh, which is uh, disability adjusted life years. In other words, the number of life years lost. Um, and so this is 49 million, um, 49.7 million life years lost every year because of diarrheal diseases. Um, and, and the life years is calculated based on a weighted, you know, this is a public health term, based on a weighted, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, accounting for the disability itself. So for example, if you lose an arm, you know, you still, you're still living, but that's equivalent to, let's say, you know, 10% of a life year, right? So the quality of life is embedded in that DALI's uh, term there. Okay, so I showed you some pictures from, from overseas and you might think that this is a problem basically in sub-Saharan Africa, right? Very poor countries or, or Asia, but it actually is also happening here in the US. So we've got more than 2 million Americans who live without basic access to safe drinking water and sanitation. Uh, this is a picture in West Virginia. You have people who don't have access to water at their house. They go to this pipe system and they collect the water in bottles like this. Um, you have 1.4 million people who don't have access to indoor plumbing. They don't have a, a sink. They don't have a toilet. Uh, here is a picture of what's called a, a, um, a straight pipe solution. Uh, it's not a solution at all, but you basically flush your toilet, you have a straight pipe going to your backyard, and that's where your wastewater goes, your sewage goes. It's just basically a cesspool. Uh, so this is happening in the U.S., right? Um, it's not just a, you know, uh, a developing country problem. And one of the points I want to bring out today is the intersection between water quality and access to sanitation and um, communities who are vulnerable, whether they're lower income or they're more ethnic, ethnic communities. And this map shows the intersection between drinking water violations. This is where we have the data, right? So drinking water violations and how minoritized, if you will, the uh, community is, you know, uh, in terms of ethnic and language. Um, so the darker the color of the county, um, the more that intersection is, the higher that intersection is, correlation between the quality of the water and the increasing fraction of the community that is a population of color. So you can see large swaths of the country where you have basically very, very uh, uh, straight up correlation between being poor and being uh, non-white and speaking another language to poor water quality. And a lot of these systems are basically that, like that, lots of violations. So that the NRDC 
in the report uh, a few years ago basically said the greatest um, predictor of low quality water in the US is basically income and people of color, right? The lower the income and the more people of color, the more that they have less safe water. So if you think about what our vision should be, right? It should be basically a world where everyone, regardless of you know, geographic location, socioeconomic status, everyone has access to high quality sanitation and water services. So, you know, how do we do this? Well, we got to do this in a way that recognizes that this is a complex, multifaceted problem. It's not just an engineering problem. It's not just a money problem. I'll talk a little bit about some of these key issues that we have to address, right? But we also need to rethink how we do things and change how we do engineering research and training. So I'll go into that a little bit. Right? So here's my way of thinking about this problem. Um, and I think about this in terms of systems. Here's a systems approach, four key areas that need to be addressed address to solve the sanitation crisis. So the first one is what we call an, an enabling environment. And what does that mean? It means that you've got government policies. It means that you've got laws and regulations uh, that actually prioritize sanitation, right? Right now, it's not happening in many countries. Uh, obviously, water is a sexier thing, right? I mean, people know about, okay, water campaigns, clean drinking water, but sanitation is usually an afterthought. It's not something that, um, you know, is prioritized by policymakers. And sometimes when they, you know, do have a uh, policy, it's more for centralized systems, big systems, um, and, not, and not decentralized systems can, can serve more poor areas. We have limited data in many of these countries. We're still, it's harder to get the data in terms of the need and what's been done. We don't have a lot of people trained in this area. And, and also there's a lack of integrated planning. If you, if you go to a, a big city in, uh, in Asia, for example, or in Africa, uh, you know, these mega cities, they just basically build on each other and there's no centralized integrated planning, right? So that's the first key. The second key is we need more technologies that address inequities. So on the left is a, is a pit latrine uh, that's in Malawi. So I took that picture from the outside. I didn't want to go inside, right? Because you can see the cracks in the, you know, in the, in the soil there. Uh, and I knew that that pit was deep, about 15 feet deep. And I also knew that that was not structurally um, secure. You know, basically it was just mud and soil. Actually it's clay. And the reinforcement is just, you know, pieces of wood. It's not concrete, it's not steel bar. I, I was afraid of falling in. And how do you create, you know, a better way of thinking or create a better toilet essentially that can be used that's more sustainable, right? Uh, one of the things that we work on uh, in our work in environmental engineering is thinking about reimagining the infrastructure so that you don't have this current focus on the large systems, like going from left to right, but actually looking at small systems also, individual systems at home and small clusters. Uh, so going from, from right to left. And the idea is that these systems have inherent economic advantages. They have inherent environmental advantages and also social advantages. You can save money because you save money on the pipes. You are actually making uh, the, the infrastructure where they need it. And you can even integrate this within the community so that you provide jobs in the communities. Uh, you can reduce the energy footprint for um, high energy uh, use for these large systems uh, and so on. And But the most important thing is addressing the inequity gap that we talked about at the bottom there, right? So this is a, a very long discussion. I just wanted to you know, start uh, us this, you know, thinking about some of these issues. So here's a, here's a schematic if you wanna think about centralized systems versus distributed systems or cluster systems. So at the bottom, you have things that you can do in terms of technologies and the households, and then cluster systems, you know, groups of houses, and then maybe small systems on the top. Okay. So the, the challenge is how do we develop technologies that will work with all of these systems and all of these scales that works with communities and that incorporates uh, sustainability and resilience. So the third key is how do you make this profitable? 
um, how can we make it so that people can make money out of it, right? Because remember, there's billions of people who need access. And as long as people are not making money out of that, then it's always money going, going in in the form of grants, right? Or aid from rich countries. So for things to be sustainable and to scale up, you need to think about economic incentives and opportunities. And then finally, we need to think about social and behavioral change. So again, that, that photo on the left, right? Uh, photo on the right is from my friend Dave Still. This is in South Africa. The arrow, I don't know if you can see the guy there, right? At the bottom. And that guy has a mask, uh, but he doesn't have a shirt on uh, and doesn't have you know gloves and so on. And he's down there emptying the pit. So, uh, you know, there's a lot that we, we need to change. Uh, I think I have time to, to show a short video. Okay, let's see if this is gonna work. Okay. Uh, wait, can you see my screen? No. I'm going to share. this other screen here, okay? And this is emptying a pit latrine in Kenya. Sorry, let me share this again, make sure. Uh, and you should be seeing, wait, I'll pause it again, sorry. Okay, let me, let me make sure that you can see, okay, and I'll just adjust the size of it, okay. Oh, oh, did it stop? Right. Sorry, did it stop in the middle? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I'm having issues with my... Okay, let me, uh, let me make sure I can share with you this. If it's a YouTube link, maybe you could send it in the chat and I could try to share it with everyone as well. Yeah, it's a, I think um, it's a Vimeo and it was working earlier. If I'm, if I, okay, so maybe even if it's small, that's fine. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll still share it. Okay, let's see what I can do here. Okay. <laughs> 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 So this is manual emptying in Kenya. You know, that's fecal, that's the fecal material. There's no gloves, right? There's no uh, PPE, proper protection. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's just basically very manual. You can imagine you're dripping fecal material all over. Bamba dinga. Uh, 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 
You can also see that the, the river bank is the solid waste disposal, right? We got all of that. Okay. So uh, there's a lot that we need to do, right? Um, in terms of, um, you know, ma making sure that, um, you know, we can address some of these issues. Okay, let me just stop this then. Um, okay, so I'm ready to, you know, answer questions and we can, we can discuss global sanitation. I had a question to start off. What do you sure. see as the future to make it better? Because do you think there could be like infrastructure in developing countries to help or? Yeah, so so again, uh, the way that we want to think about this is those four key areas, right? So we want to make sure that we um, create this environment where governments actually prioritize sanitation. Uh, in a lot of these countries, even though um, they put they put some uh, money into it, if there are no policies that actually um, you know put teeth in regulations, you know there's got to be penalties for for doing things like that, right? It's it's basically dumping a lot of fecal material into the river. That's not a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, if they don't have a choice, then that's what they'll keep doing. Right? So on the one hand, you provide the infrastructure and the technologies, and then you disincentivize that kind of uh, behavior, right? You make it illegal. Uh, and then you give people uh, and businesses um, you know, the right tools and the right technologies and the right incentives so that they do the right thing. So it's like a carrot and a stick approach there. Uh, and to do that, you wanna make sure that you educate people uh, you want to have the technologies available. You have to have the, um, you know, the economic incentives available. So it's a really an integrated approach. So one question in the chat uh, from Lucy is: Is there anything we can do to help? Um, and in fact, I think let's see if in my slides, I maybe I have. I may have forgotten the important slide, <laughs> but yes. Uh, but in, in summary, um, you know, there are several things, right? One is um, becoming aware of this issue is one thing that's part of the enabling environment, right? People don't want to talk about this. So putting this out in the open, uh, there are ways that we can contribute to NGOs and uh, organizations that are working on this issue, uh, whether financially, uh, or um, really knowing more about their work. And maybe, you know, it's possible uh, that later on in terms of expertise, you can contribute expertise also to their work. Um, there are lobbying organizations in the US that are basically saying sanitation is a human right and that this is part of what we need to do. I mean, of course, there's so many problems in the world right now, right? I mean, basically there are, there's a war going on and, and famine and, and all kinds of issues. And this is another issue. But um, in the US, we do have the resources to reach out and help um, some of these countries you know, that are faced with, with uh, sanitation issues. So 
there are organizations that we can reach out to and help in terms of what they're doing. Um, you know, believe it or not, I mean, you were talking about um, uh, biotechnology, and this is also a question. So Zafira asked, what research do you do that relates to this? Um, uh, well, that's actually one major area of my research is global sanitation. And so if you think about uh, that sanitation chain I showed earlier from the toilet to uh, you know, conveyance and, and transport and treatment and reuse. So we have research projects all along that whole um, you know, chain. So for example, um, we've got a technology uh, that we've patented and developed over the last 10 years that basically mechanizes that emptying process. So that manual emptying, you don't have to do that anymore. So we have a technology that um, you know, we're trying to get commercialized right now so that businesses can use that as their major technology so that they can create a business that's more efficient and more hygienic, right? So they can take it out without doing what, what you saw earlier. Um, on the treatment side, uh, and that work is funded by the Gates Foundation. Uh, on the treatment side, we're talking about how do we convert fecal sludge into resources? So whether that's um, anaerobic digestion, so you can convert that to energy, uh, or basically treating it so that you, know, uh, that you don't have uh, that waste contributing pathogens to the environment. Um, so again, we've got, we've got uh, research that spans those. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with TED, TED.com. Uh, you know, there are talks there and, and I do have a talk there from a few years ago. If you just look for TED, you know, you can put my name in or you can put sanitation on TED Talks and you will see a talk there where I talk a little bit more about some of these issues. Um, yeah. So let me just see what else is here. Uh, what environmental issues will require the most attention in the next few years? Oh, there's, there's a lot really. Um, um, and, and you can't um, really address them all. And they're interrelated too, right? So climate change, for example, is a big one, uh, as you all know, because that is almost an existential threat to us as a civilization, as humans. But climate change, I mean, there's all angles to that too, right? So sanitation is also something that you can think about in the context of climate change and, and how flooding can impact different people as well as on the adaptation side. So I talked about how you convert the waste to energy and resources. That's going to help with greenhouse gas emissions, right? So that's another approach. Um, of course, just thinking about the environment, you know, um, with increasing production of materials, uh, you've got, you know, you know, plastics is a is a thing. You've got these contaminants that are in our water, in our soil. You've probably heard of perfluorinated compounds, right? PFAS. I don't know if you've heard of that acronym, but it's in our water. People are finding it everywhere. Um, so lots of environmental issues uh, that we need to, to think about, right? I chose to focus on sanitation because it's along the you know the lines of what I've been trained uh, on, on doing, right? Basically it's environmental engineering and wastewater. Um, and I think, you know, you can't really solve all the problems and all the environmental problems of the world. You've got to pick the one that you're passionate about and then work on it. Yeah. Hassan is asking, do you think that industrialization will have to occur alongside the sanitation improvements? Uh, to become, uh, for the improvements to become, you mean permanent, right? I asked because I believe that became important first of all after the formation of industrial cities. cities. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think let's put this in context, right? Um, you're right, Hassan, in that the way that societies have evolved follow this model where, you know, it was agricultural and then you have industrialization and so on, right? The question is, it's 2000, you know, it's 2022. Um, and, you know, almost everywhere in the world, if you go to Africa anywhere, you know, people have cell phones. I mean, anywhere in the world, the poorest country in the world, uh, they will have cell phones. And so there's technology happening, right? Uh, but then people have cell phones, but they don't have toilets at home. 
right? Or, or they have open defecation. So it's 2022. Uh, and does that model of development, does that still apply, right? And and what should the future look like for, for all of us um, in the world? Um, of course, it is a question of resources. It's a question of, uh, uh, you know, poorer countries will have a, a tougher time solving it. But at the same time, uh, again, there are technologies that are available in these countries uh, that just boggle the mind too, right? Like I said, cell phones are in Zambia, they're in Malawi, they're in Kenya. Um, so there are leapfrogging technologies. We don't have to follow this linear, you know, agriculture industrialization curve. Uh, we can think of a, of a future where, you know, the basic services, the basic infrastructure is, uh, is available to, uh, to, to the people. So I don't know if that answers your question, uh, but it, it does require resources. Yeah. So thanks, uh, Rebea, for that. Yeah. There's also, a, I don't know if you're familiar with TED Ed. Uh, these are the animation. Um, and and uh, so I wrote one on the history of toilets, actually. Um, so, so it's there. You can also take a look at that. Um, and then I have one that's coming out also on water reuse. Like how can we turn our wastewater into usable water? Um, but that's gonna take a few more months before that's out, yeah. Uh, thanks, Hassan. Are there any other questions? I mean, in the chat or do you wanna just uh, turn on your mics? In um, the U.S., for like sanitation issues, is it in cities or is it a lot in like Midwest and rural areas? Like you're saying, like those oh, the, the two million people. Are. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of that. Uh, let me put that in context. Uh, so a lot of those are in. Um, so you count Puerto Rico, for example, right? Um, and then a lot of those are in, in rural areas as well as in urban uh, areas. And in the urban areas, we've got these pockets of um, people who are not connected to centralized water and sewer. Okay. Uh, they're, they're in what's called underbounded communities. So you've got the city boundary. Sometimes it's a donut around them, right? So sometimes you've got subdivisions or, or urban communities that are basically all around them are developed and connected to sewer lines, but then they are not. So, mm -hmm. you know, and then you have what's called extraterritorial jurisdictions. So for example, City of Raleigh, right? It's, it's it, the, the service area is bounded and people who are on the fringes are actually, you know, don't have sewer lines. I mean, I, I happen to live actually in an extraterritorial jurisdiction. You know, I, I, it's technically in Raleigh, but I'm not served by sewer. So I have a septic tank. I, but I live a little bit, um, you know, in the Lake Wheeler area. I don't know if you know that. It's like south of Raleigh. And, um, you know, for the most part, uh, you know, there are, there are differences too, right? Some people live out there for the land, which is what, what, um, why we're here. Uh, at least my family decided that we wanted more space. Um, but some other people are out there because that's cheaper to live in. And then, and then they don't have the services. Uh, it's a combination. Also, uh, Rabea, the homeless are counted there in that number. Okay. And then people in reservations and people like uh, Native uh, American populations, uh, the Navajo, for example, you know, you know, hundreds of acres and they have no services. Right. Um, colonias along the border. Um, and, and again, smaller rural communities. There's a basic, there's a uh, famous case now in Alabama uh, Lowndes County in, in, in Alabama, where that picture was taken, that straight pipe picture that you saw. Yeah, so they've, you've got these communities where basically they flush their toilet and just goes out into their backyard, uh, primarily because there's, the soil is not suitable for, for doing septic tanks. So it's a technology issue, it's a funding issue. Um, and and uh, 
the, there's the new infrastructure bill that's been approved, the Infrastructure and, and, and Jobs Act. Um, and then some of that money is gonna go to these communities so that they can have resources um, to solve those issues. Yeah. And I wanted to maybe, this is the, the slide that I did not, I should have shared earlier. Um, you know, what, what can we do? Um, reimagine the solution, deploy resources strategically, build community power and foster creative collaboration. I know those are all general terms, um, but uh, many organizations are working along, um, you know, alongside communities to, to do all these things, right? Um, make it, make this an issue that people actually know about um, in the US and overseas and empower communities uh, and co-design solutions with communities. These are, you know, some of the things that uh, we can do. I think that's all the questions for today. I just want to thank you again for joining us and like teaching us all about global sanitation. And I hope we can have you back on a science sprint sometime next semester or in sure. the Sure. Yeah. Thanks. And and uh, I mentioned earlier I'm part of the biotech faculty at NC State. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, my lab also does does you know DNA and RNA work on um, solutions for uh, wastewater treatment. Mm -hmm. So we basically, you know, use some of the same um, um, instruments that uh, Dr. Goller was showing in terms of asking, how can we influence the microorganisms so that they can convert our waste to resources? Okay. okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Okay.